um, sweet. And we have not done the salute to the flag yet, so we're going to start with that.
and a can-do attitude that never wavers for all of us who count on her in so many different ways. We've noticed, as time has gone by, that she is one of the last ones to leave in June for the summer break, and one of the first ones back in mid-August, checking to see if the class lists are almost ready and beginning to set up and decorate another warm and inviting classroom for the new school year. Mrs. Licata is the grade level leader for our first grade team of teachers. Her teaching colleagues welcome her leadership and supportive presence at grade level meetings and during times of decision making with regard to the curriculum. With her 15 years of teaching focus on the kindergarten and first grade level, Mrs. Licata is now a master teacher at the primary level and looked to by her colleagues for guidance, coaching, and just plain good advice on how to keep up with and adapt to the mandated changes in teaching and in testing. Mrs. Licata has a wonderful sense of humor and she is very modest about her talents. Right now, I'm sure she is saying to herself, Come on, Joe, bring it to a close. <laughs> I will, Michelle, but in a little bit. Tonight is your night and the five other teachers' night to receive an award and recognition for teaching excellence, the key to enabling our students to make it in this demanding world. The six of you deserve a bright spotlight tonight. I know that many parents are grateful to Mrs. Licata. Over the years, as her principal, it has been very rewarding to hear parents say things like, Mrs. Licata finally got my son to like school. Mrs. Licata got him to settle down. My daughter will do anything for Mrs. Licata. Not so much for me, but if Mrs. Licata says it needs to be done, she'll do it. My daughter comes home every day beaming and talking about Mrs. Licata. Mrs. Licata understands my son. She gets him and knows just how to work with him. My daughter loves coming to school because of Mrs. Licata. Each year in June, when we begin to think about placing students at each of the grade levels for the next school year, we do our best to match each student's needs to the skills, talents, and styles of our teachers. I have noticed that without fail, year in and year out, when placing students with special needs in kindergarten and first grade, the name Michelle Licata has come up very often as the go-to teacher to work with students facing a variety of challenges. In discussions about individual students and their placement, teachers, administrators, and school counselors have often spoken about Mrs. Licata as the best choice. That's who we should go with. So many of those meetings included comments like, this young man is going to need Mrs. Licata. <laughs> She'll be able to handle his attention problems. This young lady is extremely shy, but she'll blossom with Mrs. Licata. This young man's mom is going to be a teacher whom she'll confide in about her difficult family situation. I suggest we go with Mrs. Licata. I could go on for a long time sharing with you all of the positive comments that I have so proudly witnessed about Mrs. Licata's teaching strengths. I have shared a few of them with you because I feel that they best capture the reason that this exceptional teacher, now in her 15th year of teaching, so richly deserves to be named Cedar Hills Teacher of the Year. She is what we call a natural, someone whose accomplishments are, yes, the effect of a lot of hard work, coursework, and training, but also the result of a genuine passion for primary teaching and a special God-given gift of relating so well to children and enabling them to feel good about themselves and motivated to learn. Those are special gifts. Ms. Okada has, for the last 15 years, enabled so many children to successfully start their quest for learning and a good quality of life. 
It is clear that Mrs. Okada's personal efforts and professional talents as an educator has, have produced a lot of great results, academic as well as social and, and emotional in children. She deserves, very much deserves, to be in a category we call standard set. Michelle, you make us all very proud to call ourselves teachers. Congratulations on being named Teacher of the Year. You deserve to be recognized as one of the best of the best in Bernice Township. And that is a very high honor that you have worked very hard to earn. Thank you for all that you've done and best wishes for many, many more fulfilling years of teaching here at Cedar Hill. Yeah. Selection was unanimous. 
It makes us all proud at LCS to have the caliber of professionalism that is Karen Aaron Albert representing us as a teacher of the year. Congratulations. Excellent diagnostic and therapeutic skills. 
As a reading coach, Dawn has the opportunity to share her knowledge and skills with classroom teachers so that everyone in the classroom, not just her small group, instruction students, benefit. She always has a smile on her face and a bellowing laugh to go along with it. I believe that we at Mount Prospect are extremely lucky to have Dawn here because her success with students translates to our school being as successful as it is. Most importantly, I have seen her grow as a truly reflective practitioner. She continues to believe and trust in her own abilities as a creative and analytical thinker and shares this insight with others in our school, across the district, and most importantly, Paul Cipolla and myself. So we are very, very lucky to have such a wonderful and outstanding individual in our midst. You are most deserving of this honor. Congratulations.
Mrs. Clark earned a BS in physical education and a Master's of Arts in Physical Education Athletic Administration from Springfield College in Massachusetts. Uh, and she acquired another 15 credit hours at Fresno Pacific <coughs> University's Continuing Education Program. Mrs. Clark touches so many young people's lives through her tireless efforts in a myriad of school activities. As a teacher, mentor, advisor, and coach, she makes a real difference in those students' lives that she comes in contact with. Whether she is involved in arranging fundraisers for cancer, her field hockey team, or through a benefit and hockey game, or creating and directing our first ever Ridge Factor talent show, Mrs. Clark is always willing to help and is constantly looking for new challenges. Her successes are many. Mrs. Clark has been recognized with many awards, including Star Ledger Coach of the Year in Somerset County and Courier News Coach of the Year for field hockey. However, she will tell you that our biggest honor is when her students and or athletes recognize, are recognized for their efforts. Mrs. Clark has received training beyond her degrees by attending the New Jersey Association of Health, Physical Education, and Recreation and Dance Convention since 2008. Attending two-day convention was consisting of a variety of current and relevant instructional strategies, activities, and topics. Kim completed the Project Use High Ropes course training, which she underwent six hours of training in high ropes course implementation and safety. She complemented that training with Adventures in Peer Leadership training, which is a 15-hour course on current trends in Project Adventure. The uh, debriefing techniques and the implementation, implementation of a peer leadership program. Mrs. Clark states, Core curriculum content standards are the driving force behind lesson planning and assigned assessment building. By keeping the overarching goals in mind, I am able to develop plans that align with our state and regional benchmarks. The most important part of my job as an educator is to connect with all my students. I want students to feel safe, to ask questions, to challenge opinions, and to learn freely. I believe that when students feel comfortable in a classroom, they are more likely to engage in the activities that enable them to genuinely learn and retain information. My philosophy is simple. I aim to educate the whole student, spirit, mind, and body. I am a firm believer that my content area is perhaps one of the most important in high school students' schedule, and I want to develop well-rounded young adults who actively contribute making the world a better place. Congratulations, Kim, to you and your entourage. <laughs> Please.
Mr. Isaac teaches game design and development and has developed nationally recognized programs. He will tell you that his approach to teaching is that of a facilitator and a co-learner with his students. He incorporates a quest-based learning environment that provides choice in the learning pathway that his students will choose. He is passionate about games and the intersection of games and learning. He is working with our PTO at this moment to create one of the most state-of-the-art game design rooms, I would say, in the nation. He is an avid member of our STEM committee and works tirelessly to make connections to the cross-curricular programs in our building, as well as the new STEM initiative that we're looking to implement at the middle school. Mr. Isaacs is one of our technology specialists as well. There he learns to deal with the most challenging learner, his colleagues. As you can imagine, not all of us come with a sense of comfort level when it comes to technology initiatives by the district, and he meets each of them at their need and their readiness level. He works to make sure that your children have the technology tools up and running when the school begins, and that the teachers who are utilizing them know how to work them. He encourages all of us to be 21st century thinkers in the way that we're presenting information to our children, and certainly the way that he presents information to us as learners. He's patient, he supports each of us at our levels, he makes sure that the students continue to strive to push themselves, as well as the colleagues that he works with. Mr. Isaacs is extremely active in the game-based learning community, and he presents conferences around the country to share his work. I believe the Olympic Gates and Google and a whole list of other technology consortium know Mr. Isaacs. Recently, he has helped to form the Games for Ed initiative, a nonprofit organization working to reduce the barriers and demonstrate efficacy in terms of unique games in the classroom for learning. He is also the co-founder of the EdTech Bridge, an international community that brings EdTech stakeholders, educators, developers, students, and researchers together to gather to, to develop collaborative relationships in order to build better EdTech products to benefit education. Often we have visitors from research and development who want to come visit our programs at the middle school, and that is key to his design in his classroom and allowing the children to really strive to learn and build games with his lead. In conclusion, Mr. Isaac continues to be on the forefront of technology education, not only in William Annan, but in the country. He is seen as a leader in his building, but also in his field. I am proud to introduce the 2015 WAMS Teacher of the Year, Mr. Steve.
And so the linking idea here, when we talk about STEM, when we're talking about the science, technology, mathematics, using with the vehicle of engineering, linking all of those together. And so you can see this engineering design process as we go through this evening and we talk about STEM programs, this is really what's linking together the, uh, the science and technology and engineering. So keeping that in mind, we identified some programs that, uh, that were suggested to us in model programs that we went to visit. So the first one was at Morristown High School. So this Morristown High School has a, uh, has, has a program that's been along for a very long time. And it has started off uh, with, with very much biomedical focus and a research focus. It has been, uh, they have been evolving that into more of, a, uh, of an engineering and a STEM type program. So Horstown was one of the first schools that we went to visit. Uh, what we found interesting about Horstown is it is a comprehensive high school, very much like Ridge High School. And we wanted to see how they were attacking uh, this challenge of, of, of having uh, these types of experience for students. So some of the, the key ideas that came out of our trip to Morristown, they had an academy model. So essentially this was a school within a school of that model. So their enrollment is about 1,500, and they select approximately, through an application process, they select approximately 50 students uh, per grade uh, to, to be a part of this. So two classes of students participate per grade to go through. Uh, some of the uh, two ideas of their STEM program, most of the courses that they offer are, are elective, so they still have the core science and mathematics courses, and then their STEM courses are elective courses. And another interesting thing that we took from that is they have this core group of, of STEM students that go through, but other students in the high school who aren't part of the academy, they're still in they can still take these courses as a as We saw that as a uh, as um, Some of the courses carry an honors weight. And, uh, and that sort of helps with uh, one of the challenges that they, they spoke to us about when we were there was they didn't want uh, to have a program that would uh, force students who want to take an 18-year honors track to avoid their STEM program because of, of how it would impact the children. So, so that was a, an interesting thing. So some of the, um, some of the, I guess, the rules of their academy. In ninth grade, all of the students participate in an introductory course. And it's really a research-based course. They have required field experiences and required summer course. Uh, I, I mentioned before that there's a strong research component. Many of their students in, uh, in state and national uh, science, uh, science fair type competitions. The tracks they have, they have multiple tracks that students can have, so they specialize almost like, uh, like in college, if they choose a major, they, they pick a special, specialty track. And Morristown offers a track for biomedicine, engineering, architecture, sustainability, and computer science. One of the one of the, uh, the the shining strengths of their program was their partnerships. They had developed partnerships and built partnerships uh, with, uh, with corporations, uh, with the local hospital, uh, and with other professionals. In fact, every Wednesday they have a professional come in from a STEM to present to to students the building. They call it their lunching area. So this was something that, that STEM students participate in, but was really it was open also to the new students that was interesting. Uh, very interesting. And, and it, it's a pretty uh, it's a, there's a lot of logistics uh, involved in this, and then having STEM supervisor the the overseas programs. Thank you. So I'll take school number two. We went a little bit uh, far afield for school number two. Uh, we wanted to see something a little bit outside the box. So we started with Morristown, uh, not necessarily you know, exactly similar um, demographically, but size-wise, uh, as a conference high school, it was a good starting point, a lot of good things. 
But we really wanted to broaden our horizons and see what could you do if you really were able to break all the rules. So we took a trip down to the um, Science Leadership Academy in Philadelphia. And it was interesting for the fact that it is a public school. It's part of the Philadelphia public school system. But it was literally designed from the ground up. So for us, it's a little experiment. And what can you do if you start with nothing? Right? You literally have nothing. It's a blank slate. Build the school how you want. Uh, and we thought that would really show us some interesting things because there's no starting rules. Uh, indeed, that's what we found. So one of the things that was interesting, that is concepts of three. How do we learn? What can we create? What does it mean to lead? They're the underlying uh, premises they built their school upon. They have a partnership with the Franklin Institute, so once again, you see another partnership. A small school, only 125 students per year, right? So you're talking around 500 total for the entire high school. Um, and they did have a one to one uh, laptop program built in that started off with Apple products and then became uh, Chromebooks. And then as the money got a little tighter, the Chromebook uh, won the one to go. So they had something interesting also called grade level themes. So each grade level thematically approached all courses with the idea of identity, systems, change, and creation. So every freshman course had that core idea of identity. Everything they talked about the back of that through all different various uh, means. Cross-cutting things across all courses, standards-based testing, which was really very interesting, and you know, difficult to do, difficult, difficult to carry out in um, public school. But basically, they keyed all assessments to a uh, standard. And you took that assessment when you felt you were ready to take that assessment. So if you felt like you had that mastered, you would go to your teacher and say, I'm ready for assessment number three on that standard. You would take the assessment. And if you weren't successful, you had the ability for a retake. So a very different way of looking at assessment for the school. Uh, once again, an application and interview process, which was pretty common. Uh, and nothing was common. We saw an engagement and interest, not just grades. Right? So they wanted passionate students, students who were interested in doing what the school was about. So this was a picture that we took because we just thought it was so interesting. We walked around and this, this was the middle of Philadelphia in a kind of a, not quite a high rise, but a large building. And these posters were everywhere. So we took the picture because we wanted to really remember this, this consistent message, right? Everywhere these freshmen went, they saw this poster that said identity. Right? You see it says, who am I? Uh, how do I interact with the environment? How does the environment affect me? Right? That same message every hallway and again and again in every class. And we thought that was special. That we thought that was something you could take away from this type of program and you can do it in a public school for easily. Um, this was an interesting thing we saw in oh, uh, interesting thing we saw in the teacher's workroom. It was an idea of what are they what is the thinking, right? What is the thinking behind the school operates? And the one thing that jumped out at us was this idea of silos no, lenses yes. Right? So not this is a science class, and now we're in math class. Right? Instead, what are we, how are we looking at those subjects, or what lens are we looking through? I think uh, Paul mentioned the idea of engineering, right? being that lens really that we look through right, to approach all this content that we're talking about today. And the kind of last but not least, they had a common rubric. The same rubric was used in every course, no matter what the course was. So what I thought was neat about that, it spells out, right, what are we concerned about in our school? Right? What matters to us? This is what matters to us. Design, knowledge, application, presentation, process. Right? So they really hammered home some very specific things. Um, I thought that was a pretty unique way to approach learning. It's a very successful school and obviously in the middle of a large urban school district. Um, and you could always make the argument, yes, but they're the 125 kids they want, but they didn't use grades as an identifier. So that made it a little bit you know, interesting to see how they were able to put that school together, not just a cherry picking the top students on the front. So back to something that was a little bit more similar to what we were looking to do was we went and visited TDEC. And their program was called TEAMS, which stands for Technology Enriched Academy for Math and Science. And I think TEAMS was very appropriate as an acronym for them to use because everywhere you looked in the school, you could see that culture embodied within the students. They had goodie sweatshirts that they were wearing around that had teams written across it. It was certainly a culture they had developed. The program has been around for over a decade, so it certainly has had its successes, um, and it, the coordinator was able to share some of the pitfalls and the ups and downs. The courses in the program, similar to what we were talking about before, all have honors credit, which certainly does make an impact in terms of the type of student who is looking to choose those programs. 
The interesting thing that they did, a little bit differently, uh, was that there was a bell schedule that was separate for the students within the program. So in the morning, the, the classes that you were to take part in with the Teams Academy were two 85-minute blocks. And then in the afternoon, those students joined in with the rest of the school population. Also, all of the courses that are open to the students in the Teams Academy are also open in separate sections to students who are not in the academies. And finally, one of the things that really impressed us about this was there was a faculty member who was the coordinator of the program. And she certainly had a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of energy that really carried the program through. Within this, one of the other common themes that we saw, as in other uh, districts as well, was that the application process was looking for good grades, but there was also an interview, a recommendation, and an essay involved. They had about a 50% acceptance rate when they had 80 applicants for 40 spots. And in order to be considered a graduate as part of the academy, you had to make it through all four years within the academy. So they did acknowledge that sometimes students would start within and then they would drop out from the academy, not drop out of school, but just drop out of the program in general and not be part of the graduating cohort. One of the things that really spoke to us as well was this freshman orientation course. It was designed to be something that really was team building for the students and gotten involved with understanding how to work together, how to work with the engineering design process that Mr. Hall was referring to, and really get them geared up for starting this cohort program together. And finally, just like we mentioned from Morristown as well, many of the students were participating within some of the STEM competitions. Thank you. The final school of our tour was right down the street, Watch on Hills. All the schools had their own different twists, and Watch on Hills certainly was different than the previous three. Uh, well, they provided our team with some insight to a program called Project Lead the Way, which is uh, one of the leaders in the STEM program throughout the nation. Watch on Hills has courses in engineering and design and also in architecture, so they have a limited number of courses there in those two areas. A uh, new course that's entering for Watch on Hills, as well as Project Lead the Way in September, is uh, architecture design, but for uh, uh, civil engineering. So that's a new program for both, for both schools. Uh, model use of Watch on Hills is not a cohort or academy based on a project. Uh, students have the opportunity to receive credit, uh, college credit, through Rochester Institute of Technology in New York. One of the things that we found with all the schools, there are certainly a number of commonalities, uh, certainly partnerships. Uh, Verizon is an example of a great partner to have. They just introduced a new grant opportunity for, for STEM for computer training at middle school level. Uh, relationships certainly with the local colleges. College of New Jersey was mentioned. But Rutgers also has an outstanding program for STEM technologies. And just like as uh, its Franklin Institute, Liberty Science Center, which is relatively close to us, and we've made some visits there as well, that's a wonderful opportunity for us to make some connections. Other aspects of a good STEM program, a great STEM program, is what else can it relate to? It needs to have relevance. It needs to have opportunities for students to relate to real-world um, 21st century skills. Uh, relationships that foster a, a community environment, not just with the students and with the teachers, but with truly with the community. We'll talk about that later with the remainder students. And certainly in rigor. A program is just a program, and the rigor is a great program. Certainly equipment is something that is going to be needed for STEM. There, there are some pictures on, on the screen right now. Equipment for STEM isn't just the latest and greatest. You've probably heard a lot about 3D printing as of late. Uh, NASA, for instance, took a 3D printer into space to see how well they can manufacture items in that atmosphere. Uh, on, the, on the screen, from left to right, are known as 3D printers or replicators. The bigger they are, the bigger they build. Uh, on the far right is a digital uh, analyzer where you can make a 3D prototype or something. It's we're used to the flatbed scanner or paper-fed scanner, you'll get a sheet of paper on your, on your computer screen. Put an object on the, on the scanner there, you'll create an actual 3D version of whatever it is that you're trying to create. Jump in. Is it okay if we pass a few of the around? Uh, we've had some items. We have in the middle, that is the, the medium-sized replicator, maybe a uh, 3D printer. Uh, we have two of them in our middle school right now. 
Uh, one of our teachers is here tonight, Mr. Potter. He is taking his students through a variety of tests. And so we have some little handouts for you to keep. Can't keep all of them. I have to have those back up as told. Uh, so please take, take a look at them. Uh, every one of the items that you have, it's not just plug it into the computer and let it spit it out. It takes mathematical problem solving to create the right fit, especially with the scoop and the nut that you have there. It's not just about 3D digital tools to create uh, a makerspace for this type of a course. We also include vinyl cutters, which we have at the middle school, laser cutters, a CNC machine, which is a computerized and vertical control machine. It can do cutting and drilling and machining of, of wood, metal, plastic, and it's all fed to the computer. It creates a wonderful product. In addition to these types of items, Perfect stem tools are basics. A drill, a drill press, a soldering iron, a sewing machine. So it's not all about the latest and greatest 3D digital items. There's a lot of general items that we've used in this area for years. So now that what we've all been waiting for, we told you a little bit about the experiences of the committee and uh, some of the members over the past 10 months, the programs we've looked at, some of the research we've done. And what we try to do is put that all together, put those things together, put them on the table and say, what works for William at the middle school, what works for the high school, what works township. Uh, and that's really where the challenge suddenly comes in, right? You have a built-in model, an existing model. How do you uh, inject something into that and not disrupt all the success that we've had, all the flow that the students have had? Right. So, we'll explain how we go for So, we started off with a vision and some goals. So. When we, we began laying out what the proposal, the first idea was, well, what do you see it looking like? If, if you thought five years down the road, what do you see that Bridge High School program looking like? What are the experiences of the students? What's happening in the building? And this is what the committee came up with. This is directly the committee, right? So school within a school and academy model, purposefully integrated, project-based learning. So that idea of purposefully integrated, talk about that a lot because do sometimes science and math cross over and you have connections? Absolutely. That is very different than purposefully integrating courses together. Right? So that was that vision. Uh, partnerships with key stakeholders in, in the district and outside, and being a model program, okay, a teacher that inspires students. So staffing and program one. Uh, and then they created two goals that they wanted going forward. So the proposal is as follows. We would like to create a four-year cohort-based academy model of instruction at Rich High School. It would have three courses of study, computer science, engineering, and sustainability. It would have application-driven enrollment. That enrollment is based on interest and motivation, not solely based on grades. And so it's not simply look at a student's transcript, look at a, a set of scores. It's an application process, I'll talk about that. And utilize the national programs, like Project Lead the Way, AP, and also some internally designed courses that we know we have already or will develop. Um, most, and that most means all but one, academy courses will be available to all rich high school students, regardless of being in the academy program or not. Uh, we like the idea that we, we saw in TNEC on that summer program, we thought that's really a, a very good starting point, so we'd like to propose a two day summer orientation. We will really strongly believe that an open makerspace in the building critical part of developing students as learners uh, in STEM. And so we propose having the classroom that we dedicate to STEM available to students in an open maker space uh, for school, after school, during lunch, as much as we can staff will have them available. And that the cohort will be scheduled in a common math and science courses. So I think uh, Mrs. Wolf mentioned the one school we saw where they they were in, in the morning in a block of courses together as a cohort. So for instance, if you were freshman in biology, your biology class just might happen to be a freshman or a STEM student, but still in the biology class that those students would take. Um, it is just integrated purposefully with the STEM edition. So here's the flow chart. This lays out um, the idea, grades 9 uh, through 12, and the three different topic areas there, computer science, engineering, sustainability. This will all be uh, this will all be posted online, so you'll have access to this. Like, if I go through too fast and you want to go back, um, I'll certainly make it available to everyone. So first off, you have to think right off the bat. Imagine that all the other courses are filled in. So you're really looking at electives here. 
okay? Because you still have your biology, your chemistry, and your physics, right? Your science and post graduate science, you're going to take as a senior, and see what you do. Uh, you still have whatever math courses you take, and all the other courses you would normally take. So what we had to work with was kind of a narrow band, because we want to tie into the science of math, not supplant them. So how do we do that? So you're stuck with really working with two elective periods at Bridge High School, right? So we didn't want to chew up eight, which would be every elective student might have if they took four years of oral language or four years of social studies. That would leave us with eight. So we designed a system where they had two, one, two, one. So even a student in the cohort who took four years of oral language, four years of social studies, four years of science, so on and so forth, would still have, even with this model, they would still have two open slots available take just another interest that they might have. Right? So it's not completely closed down, but that was critical. So the courses are as follows. We'll start with computer science. Computer science year one for freshmen is computer science and software engineering. That is a project lead the way course. Any course you see up here with the little acronym after it, okay, those are official project lead the way courses. Project lead the way does require three in any track okay, for project lead the way. So in year one you'd have that, and you'd have course number two, which is called design and creation. That is a course we talked about as a committee. It's not created, it's only, uh, I guess, an idea still, it's still a bit of a dream and vision, but the, the idea behind the course is to initially tie students into the design process and not just pure engineering, but how design and aesthetics is so critical to manufacturing and the process behind it. And you always, I mean, kind of always give the example of uh, Apple, if you look at Apple products, one of the great successes of that product has been their design, right, the way they look drives that, that sales, they're a good marketing too, but it is that, that design process or that the set of, of Apple products that's in their pocket. Uh, in sophomore year, of course, would be computer science applications, that's the follow up course for this one. In junior year, it is AP computer science, that course is, is going to be offered this upcoming year as a standalone. Uh, and then another new course called AP Seminar. So we'll talk more about that, but AP Seminar and AP Research are two new courses. Um, basically, college board's uh, variation on the IB, International Baccalaureate Program, okay? This is the college board's attempt to mirror that and do a very high level um, uh, research piece. And this is supposed to be tied in with another course. So the design is that whatever you're working on as your proposing course for, for the STEM issue would be kind of what you're going to be doing in that AP seminar. So for this, you might be working in something in AP Comp Sci and working on some kind of algorithm that we're doing research on. Seminar of our proposal on the presentation. And then this would finish up with computational problem solving as your kind of capstone course for this track. And once again, the student can take another elective year and they can take another elective year. And if they don't take four years of oral language or social studies, they will take all three of electives as well. Okay? So that is computer science. Um, engineering. Uh, both engineering, there's two engineering tracks, really, you'll see they're identical. So the kind of the unique thing about engineering sustainability, sustainability is really just a more focused engineering track, a little more specific. They start off the same in year one, so essentially these students have a little more flexibility in that they could um, actually do one or two. They could really make the choice in their junior year as they, what they feel is their kind of their area of specialization. Um, introduction to engineering design, IED is the initial uh, project lead the way course. That is paired up once again with the freshman course. It leads into the sophomore principles of engineering, POE. We talk to project lead the way people, they don't use the acronyms, so you have to learn this real fast, or sort of what well, I lost with this. POE is, 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 this is the second year course, principles of engineering. Uh, and then that leads in the engineering track, civil engineering and architecture. Tie once again with AP seminar. And then the capstone would be AP physics C, which already kind of exists as our, our AP students who are interested in engineering. Uh, if you're in a sustainability track, that student would choose to take environmental sustainability, which is an engineering level, paired up with the seminar, and they would end up with environmental science. Now, some of these courses that we have already, you might say, oh, well, we have that already. They would be rewritten courses. Right? We would rewrite those courses to be more focused and purposefully into the that program. So these courses that you see that are already rewritten courses. Okay. The other thing we left in, I mentioned the AP seminar, there's an AP research course that follows it, but it's not on there, right? We did not want to force students to have to take that path, right? We didn't want to block this elective and say, well, you're, you involved, you're involved in the cohort, you have literally no options. So we felt, we're going to offer that course, and we would you know, certainly encourage students who are interested in that IP-type program to take 
but that would be where they would take it. It has to follow the seminar by design and then and the track that the college board recommends is this to ensure your senior progression. Okay, um, I've got that noted here, but you don't see on there are the parent math and science courses. So now a little more detail about each. So Brian had talked about we're going to have to rewrite some courses and add some courses, and this is just a little snapshot of some of the items that we're looking at. Uh, so for right now, we're, we have a loose timeline on our, on our dates, our courses, but we're looking at uh, revising our robotics. We have two robotics courses, semester courses at the high school level. Uh, we'll be doing some regular curriculum revisions in the summer of 2016, so that's kind of right on track with all the place with this proposal. Then we're also going to start designing new courses. A new course, uh, we do a two-year writing process uh, before the courses actually start. So in 2016, summer of 2016, um, we're going to introduce game design and development. It's been such a wonderful program uh, by Mr. Isaacs at the middle school level. It just makes sense we should have that kind of program at the high school as well. Uh, adding on as in the 21st century the business department area, entrepreneurship and modern marketing. Pretty much it's going to be a, a group of students, depending upon on the course enrollment, working in cohorts, pitching a, an item, uh, troubleshooting it, brainstorming what they're going to do, and then send it to the manufacturing plant, which is going to be down the hall, wherever our space is going to be for our, for our construction. Uh, so there are some real real life uh, connotations with that. We're also looking to see how we can involve the community there as well. Uh, and then in 2017, uh, the plan is to create, design the sustainable design course, a semester course, as well as uh, start to institute the project lead the way simulation model and cybersecurity. So in looking at the, the, the course sequence, uh, project lead the way is heavily represented. So we wanted to take a moment to, to just talk a little bit more about project. So Project Lead Away is a not-for-profit company. It's, it's a, a 501 C3 company, currently used in over 6,000 schools. And I guess the last count I saw was uh, 6,500 schools in Michigan. They have many partners, uh, such as NASA, Lockheed Martin, 3M, the College Board. Uh, and they're recommended, it's one of the few programs recommended as an exemplary program by the U.S. Department of Education, uh, an exemplary standard. So the, the, the curriculum is, is a, uh, a uh, research, it's evidence-based, it's activity and problem-based. So the students are, are, are looking at problems and they're designing solutions to those problems. Some of the other benefits of Project Lead Life are possible depending on the colleges, but many, uh, many partners with, with uh, various colleges and universities around the country. And so there's a possible college level recognition similar to what we see with the AP courses. And those could, uh, depending on the schools, those could uh, result in admissions preference, or substitution credit, <coughs> uh, just like I mentioned, just like with the, uh, the Rochester Institute to technology, I believe Dr. Heinemann mentioned before, uh, they are, you know, they were one of the first partners in their, uh, their engineering program, uh, very much recruits students who, who have had successful project experiences. So one of the requirements for Project Lead Away, they, they have a mission. So they, I mentioned before, they're a nonprofit uh, company, and their mission is to prepare American students to become, uh, to be successful in the global economy. So they do that through, with a, really a, a, a two-pronged approach, through their curriculum design, through a very strong uh, professional development program for teachers. And so because of that, they require that uh, schools uh, implement their programs with fidelity. So uh, if you're going to have a project in the course, they're going to require Three of these courses, and that the teachers are, uh, are are really certified to teach it. They've gone through these training, so that's all sort of captured in, uh, in the program. So one of the things that we wanted to make sure we touched on were the connections for the AP courses, because we know at Ridge we have a very strong AP program, and as Dr. Heineman noted, noted before, all of our options. 
options, each one of those three tracks have two integrated AP courses. They have something that is specific to the track, and then they also have the AP seminar course as well. The AP seminar course looks very interesting, and we're excited to pursue that as an option for Ridge. It's really an opportunity for our students to look at real-world problems, to have discussions within the class, and to focus on a topic that is relevant to what they are studying. So the intention is that that course is taken concurrently either with another AP course, in the case of AP Computer Science, or with a specific Project Lead the Way course. And that way students can really delve into what they are interested in. Seniors then have the option, and that's why we had that extra elective period available to them, they have the option to take the AP Research course, if they choose to do so, to then have both AP Seminar and AP Research. And what happens with that, according to the College Board, is if they take both AP Seminar and AP Research, they can graduate with this AP Capstone Diploma if they also take and pass, in other words, get a score of three or higher, four additional AP courses. So it's another exciting option and another uh, option for our program. One of the other things that we wanted to make sure we focused on was some options for our students who are not in the academy. How can we make sure that they are involved as well in order to really experience some of these same opportunities with STEM? So it's important to note that any three-year progression of the Project Lead the Way courses can result in completing that pathway. So that will be open to our students who are not specifically in the academy. Also, AP Seminar and AP Research will be open to students who are not in the STEM program as well. So this is another opportunity for them to still have that chance to take those AP courses and graduate with that AP capstone. And finally, any of the above. So really, we're trying to show that we're as flexible as possible here. Any of the different electives that were previously mentioned, those can be taken during a student's elective period. So to, so to go back to this chart one last time, just to wrap it all up, the only course in this entire chart here that is not going to be available to students who are not in the academy is this design and creation course. That's the one specific academy-driven course that we plan to create. Everything else will be available to all students at Ridge. So it's like running two concurrent programs, one a cohort-based model, right, where we design it specifically or schedule students specifically together in a cohort, and another model where you might have a student who says, I, I think I might like engineering. I don't know if I want to be all in on engineering in ninth grade, but it's maybe something I might like. So maybe that student says, well, I want to take introduction to engineering design and try it and see how I like it. And so if they're not in the academy, that's fine. So they can take this course as a freshman elective. Well, maybe it turns out they do it. They do like it. They enjoy it. They want to take the next course. Well, that's fine. Just like everybody in the actual cohort, they would be taking principles of engineering. So the exact same course in the exact same year. And then that student, if they still decided they want even more, maybe you know, engineering is now a career for them, that's not a problem. They can take either civil engineering and architecture or environmental sustainability um, paired up with the AP seminar course okay? and finish with the same courses as the other students in the cohort model. Right? So these are really parallel models allowing students who maybe, you know, have to do eighth grade, aren't really experiencing that creative passion where they want to do engineering and design and that's not what they want to do, they have a path. Um, and it might be a mixed path. And a student who knows that I really Science, math, engineering, that's my thing. I really love it. I go home, it's what I do. I tinker and build, and that's that's me. That's great. Those students, that's who really have the design for. Not necessarily just a student who has top grades, really that, that creative uh, student who loves building. So, the application process, we'll start getting into some of the details uh, about that. Uh, we, we went back and forth. The nice thing about visiting all those schools is we got to see some of the pitfalls. Right? What's your application process? What, what did you do wrong at first? And everyone's very candid about saying, oh, we did this. Don't do that. This is very bad. You should try this instead. And when you look at all the process, uh, the different processes that we put together, um, the key piece is this, a great response and a personal interview. Every school said, the most critical thing you will do is have an interview process for the kids where they can come in and talk to you. That is where you're going to find the students who really are going to be able to articulate why they so passionately want to be involved in this program with students. Uh, it's hard to just look at a written paper or some problems or questions uh, and 
transcript and get that idea. Uh, we anticipate starting cohort of 60 students. That's a guess right now, it's a little flexible. That would, that would equate to three sections or three freshman sections. We will um, consider grades and achievement, obviously, but they won't be the primary driver. So we want students who will strive to be successful and work hard, but it's not necessarily just, oh, well, great job, you had all straight A's in eighth grade, you're in the program. It's going to be more to it than that in this application process. So demonstrated interest, written application, and interview are going to be the most effective way. Now, obviously, when we get um, closer to this being around, which will not be until next winter, uh, we communicate more details exactly what the criteria are, how it works, what the timelines are. Uh, we probably you know, speak to a workshop and explain everything. So th this is meant to be a really you know, rough proposal overview, so you have to understand. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about costs now. Uh, I'll talk about the staffing piece. Uh, we would like to propose that there's a staff program coordinator. It can be a, I think, a full-time job if, if we want this person to really make all those college and business connections that are possible. Uh, and to talk about some of these um, science fair for like there were challenges you know, that are out there. Um, that could be a full-time job. Or it could also be a partial teaching slash coordinating job where they teach some sections and also coordinate. Uh, I'd recommend the former, but it would be the latter that most would be successful. Additional teaching staff is hard to determine because these, these are elective courses, right? So they will supplant some other electives. And so they will probably cause us to need more staff in some way. I would anticipate um, when we look at changing electives and removing possible some old electives, that my guess would be that we need one additional staff member um, in year one. I'd recommend a makerspace advisor. The key to a makerspace is keeping it open as much as possible. Right? You want students to be able to go there after school, go there before school, work on something, whether it's an in-class creation or something for the kid who just says, oh, I'm tinkering with this thing at home, can I bring this in and work on it with a staff member who's competent with those things, right? Absolutely, come on in. So that idea of a, a segment of makerspace advisor, I think, is critical. Uh, cost for staffing student application interview pro process. Obviously, if you have 100 applicants that you have to interview, that's a pretty rigorous process, right? You have to go through time consuming, so you might have to find some way uh, to pay staff for that. Um, two days of orientation, obviously, so you can imagine three staff members for two days in the summer. And then an APA project lead the way courses. We've always obviously paid a set of teachers to AP training. That's been something we've done for years and years since I've been here. Project lead the way courses, uh, both are about the same, about $3,000 per teacher per course, right? So um, when you think about it, though, don't forget, in year one, you're, you're talking about one course, right? So you might have to send two teachers or three teachers for one course. So you're probably looking at around $10,000, uh, I would say, per year of implementation of the program. As far as facilities is concerned, a lot of that's going to be determined on what happens with the proposed high school schedule change. If, depending on how that, that pans out, we may realize some gained space through science labs, computer labs, and some other uh, teaching spaces. Uh, should there need to be any kind of renovations at that point, they hopefully should be minimal, uh, though we do have plans that we can build a tower if you really ask us to, because we kind of got a little crazy one day. Uh, so we have we have some ideas that are certainly over the top that we'll probably never move our heads, uh, but then some easier renovations and make some space. Uh, as everyone knows, space is our greatest challenge at the time, but space is a challenge for this as well. Uh, we would need at least one room dedicated to be a maker space. So we do this, what Brian was just saying, so we can have uh, students the ability to build and create and take it from home and take it from their class. Those are some items that are potential equipment items. Again, just as our cell phones seem to be changing every two weeks and computers, new ones come out every other minute, so is the technology for this area. Again, it's as low tech as a sewing machine and a soldering iron to as high tech as laser cutters and, and 3D replicators. So the, the pricing up there, uh, some of those items would be uh, a, a purchase that would last us several years. Other items like the robotics kits, uh, and materials, those are items that can be done through our regular budgeting process, and we can gradually add on to those items. Uh, project lead away cost costs $5,000. That's their current pricing for that. It includes all the licensing and the PD, and the big piece, the tech support, is huge for a venture like this. Okay, so that was Bridge Digest. Now that was pretty much the larger one. Uh, and we'll start talking a little bit about William Madden. Um, this was a little bit easier, I know, if 
next to, to Mr. Hallett, but uh, William Hannon had a, quite a robust uh, technology uh, courses and computer courses in place already. Um, so the real challenge there was how do we work within a middle school system, right? With a unique scheduling and team model, site and courses. Uh, so the constraints in many ways were greater at William Hannon uh, than at Ridge, because Ridge was kind of dealing with wide open scheduling and courses, right? So how do you fit within a middle school model? STEM program. So it's a little bit different uh, and a little bit, a little bit uh, speedier in presentation. So once again, we started off with vision and goals, right? So the middle school folks got together, they sat and they talked about, well, what do they want to look like? Three years from now, what should this program be? What do they want to see in the classrooms? So this is what they came up with. Dedicated space, resources, flexible schedule with students, and the, the last bullet point, the highlight of our, at that day, was the program would not have curriculum limitations but exploratory obligations. That was trademarked by Mr. Suda. Um, and so, and that idea, right, that idea, that visionary idea of we don't want to lock the kids down into just this thing where you march through the curriculum, we really wanted them to have the exposure to a curriculum where they could go outside the box, they could solve problems in a unique way, and not feel like you're constrained by some sort of barrier that's built into the curriculum. And so I thought that was a really, really great to start off with. And so, you know, a little learning and how do they build it through the school, through school philosophy and goals. So the proposed model is this. It's, it's pretty brief, but first off, taking the grade six and seven uh, technology and computer cycles and redesigning them using that design process loop that Mr. Halston started off talking about, right? And purposely redesigning the courses to be connected, right? So that the students have integrated experiences across the cycle, okay? From, from cycle to cycle, not these kind of discrete exposures to either technology or science or whatever that matters. Um, and then after those two years, after we've given them a more integrated experience in grade six and seven, have a new eighth grade elective. That would be a cohort-based elective, so kind of a mini, mini academy within a team model, where you have a group of students taking this eighth grade elective. That would be kind of an all-encompassing STEM elective. We'll talk a little bit about and this was the technology teachers, um, teachers and I had talked about how do you design a course um, that incorporates well some computer design while working on programming, and I take that to something where I'm looking at problem solving, and I apply a solution, and now I go back to it, and I design the solution and manufacture it. How do we do that in the school year? So we see this as a full year elective, they're going for the full year, uh, and they would kind of go through a multi-step process that is, is almost like a design and manufacturing process. Now once again, here, these things are still these are, these are a year plus away if you, go, if you go in this direction. And so these are very much, you know, more ideas here, right? We have some, some sketches and frameworks, but these are not uh, curriculum per se apparently, but they're, they're good ideas and visions that we have for what this would look like. Um, we would link this to graded science. So the real experiment here is, how much more powerful could we make a course if I am in period one, if I'm in this elective, period one I'm in my science class, in grade science, and period two, with the rest of my cohort, I made my technology, my STEM elective, right? And I have a period one teacher working in conjunction with a period two teacher. How much more powerful can we make that learning experience for students? So there's a little bit, there's, there's some research obviously that says that's a great model, but we want to see how well that worked for us with that. And I know we talk a lot about how do we grow this program. So we, we started talking about just a single cohort, but how do we grow it? And the last thing we think is going to be a huge hit because we already have some exposure to it way way that it's, it is a huge already, is the idea of a makerspace and having a place where before or after school, and more critically, during scheduled lunch periods, right, scheduled lunch times, where they're in there um, scheduled into the makerspace where part of the lunch is right now, way man and students have a study hall, right, twice a week, where they are not in the cafeteria, they're in a study hall, right? So repurpose that time and say, we don't want you sitting in a study hall, when you have your cycle, say, in seventh grade, that twice a week, you're going to go to the makerspace. Right? You're not going to go to a study. You're going to go here, and you can work on something in your cycle, or work on your own project, but you're going to be building and creating, talking with your peers, and doing something productive, uh, whether it's, it's related to school or it's maybe the project that you've been doing at home. So the application process, we anticipate the first year having 25 students study one section of um, that elective. We would very much like to grow that elective, but we talked about scheduling. Um, Mr. Tudor was sweating a little bit. How do you schedule three sections elective, pairing them up? You have to be a team 
model, uh, it is a complex schedule, I've lived through it myself, it's a complex schedule process of way back. So what we'd like to do is do this for do this model for a year and see how the schedule works and hopefully grow it in multiple sections. Uh, once again, an application process, because we're looking to find students who are passionate about it, about building and making uh, and creating a process. So a similar application process to um, a academy model. Grades and achievement are considered but not the primary driver of the students who have that interest kind of interview process. So one of the uh, anticipated costs, obviously, um, you know, there's some involved. Makerspace advisor, like I mentioned before, similar to the high school, someone who's going to man that space. That would cost money to have someone man that space. Additional teaching staff, we, we are guessing it probably won't increase if we're going one section, right? One elective, maybe three. Cycles are cycles, so changing those rules will cost your staff. If we grow the program, then we're looking at additional staff on the day that we But just one section would probably be okay. Um, lunch break staffing costs associated with you know, the makerspace, and then once again, foster staff in that um, process. So if you don't have AP or project lead the way, you don't need the training piece of it. Of course, there's training, but there's no manual training that you must accomplish for the courses at the middle school. Just as with the academy model at the high school, there would also need to be a dedicated space for, for this, this opportunity. Um, we already are kind of on our way to that room. We've identified a room at Andrew 100 um, that we're going to begin to move into over the summer. Uh, because of the efforts of our tech ed department at the middle school, the great things that they do with their students, we, we have a lot of equipment and the program is growing before it's even become a program, so to speak. So moving to a larger larger room is going to be able to easy, easier accommodate much more equipment and much more space for the students. And again, space is always our issue. Uh, so all the stuff that you're building and creating, that new room is going to create a lot more opportunities for those students. Again, the anticipated costs. These are just some suggested items. It doesn't necessarily mean this is what we're going to do going to be getting. This is something that we will discuss with the staff and once the curriculum is, is developed and written and the staff makes their recommendations. They're the experts in, in the classroom. They're the experts in our educational field and we're going to put a lot of credence to that. So we'll work together. So these are just some, some potential items. Again, rep, replicators are those three printers, uh, vinyl cutters, uh, laser cutter perhaps, and computers and of course the CNC machine. And as well as the, the cost for, for the Okay, so one of the things we've been talking about are these maker spaces. So going back to our original goal, it's, it's about 21st century readiness for our students. So we've been talking about 21st century readiness by design, designing a program that would help students to become ready to, to acquire the skill. And in addition to that, what we're what, what we need to do is provide opportunities to nurture this 21st century skills and give students an opportunity to practice those 21st century skills. One of those, uh, specifically creativity, is, is, is one that's hard to teach, uh, but is one that you can nurture. So, one of the trends we're seeing in the world today is the maker and New York Times, which is a photo of the New York Times, which describes the maker movement really as the uh, de-walk, the, the do-it-yourself uh, movement that's been going on in, in people's basements. Uh, you know, and he's bringing that into the digital age. So when we talk about the maker movement, we talk about maker spaces, we're talking about individual servants creating things like this uh, iPhone charging device uh, using online batteries. So this is something that's, that, that someone made themselves. Um, making can be anything. When we talk about maker spaces and making, these can be things like computer code, programs, games, uh, it could be metals, it could be similar to the types of objects that were passed around before, uh, you know, that, that were made on the uh, 3D printer. Textiles, uh, as the faculty mentioned, it can, the equipment can, can vary from something like a soldering iron or a sewing machine to uh, a laser cutting machine. Okay? So the advantages of making uh, would be applicational knowledge. That's one of those things that's, that's critical. Not just acquiring knowledge, knowing uh, a, a bunch of facts, but being able to take
take that knowledge and apply it to solving new problems, uh, to creating new things. Creativity and innovation, critical thinking, problem solving is critical 21st century readiness. New tools like the MakerBots that, that we've been seeing, CNC machines, drones, uh, you know, programmable microcontrollers, robotics. These new tools and technologies are, are becoming uh, more available, less expensive, and they're providing opportunities for new modes of learning. And so that's something that we want to bring into our program. The focus is process and product. Okay, the process of creating, the process of making, and the products that the students will be so we mentioned before that we've been talking a lot about uh, a STEM initiative, maker spaces, and things like that, and folks have gotten excited. And so, you know, we always have, we're here at Burner's Township, we have folks running ahead, already trying things. So at William Hammond in the Media Center, we have a, I guess what I would, I would call a seed maker space uh, that, that was set up. Uh, for students to begin to just be creative and make it. They can go during their, their lunch period, for their study hall. Yeah, I have to explain it in the answer. So, <laughs> these kids here, they're, they're using a device called a making board, uh, which is a, a programmable controller. And, and what they've done, what they're doing in this picture here, is they program the bananas to be a keyboard. So they're playing music, Synthesized music using bananas. So, and this is something that they figured out. They have the alligator clips clipped onto the, the bananas here and it's plugged into this computer. And so, other things that have been being created, uh, you know, things like jewelry, uh, they're building little catapults, they're doing all sorts of things. Uh, we have an Arduino board so they can program. We set it out and said, see if we can program it to make this light light up, and they've already figured out how to hook two of them together, and, and, and it's really, it's, it's cool. So this is, um, this is just a, a, a little mini experiment that has been a highly, highly successful so far. So maker spaces, and the types of maker spaces that we envision for both Rich and William Annie would contain a wide variety of equipment and consumable materials for students to work on progress a project that may or may not be relevant to their academic work. So they could be projects that relate to, say, an engineering course, or they could be something, as was mentioned before, this is something that I'm trying to do at home. I want to make my guitar sound different. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna come in and see if you can help me uh, to do that. Uh, it would provide a location for students to work for class hours as an extracurricular, and not just academy students, but any student who is interested. It would provide a training location for staff and new methods of instruction. So it would be a professional development opportunity embedded right within the school. And it would also, we envision, be made available to the public as part of our community to school connection. So part of your lamp breaks, and you can't find a replacement part, it would be really neat to be able to come in with that broken piece and have a high school student or middle school student uh, design a 3D model of it and put it out for so that you can come in with the children. So you see those kinds of things. The types of things So the cost per make space, again, I, I know I've said this already a couple times, it will depend on the direction we go with our curriculum what our desire toward the spaces to be. But comparison of the WAMS program the, and the high school program, it's a lot of the same items. The, the difference on the high school side is a laser cutter that, that we have. Uh, so the bottom line prices for those maker spaces, it's really not that bad when you go to the next slide. Because we already have some of the equipment. Uh, through the efforts and desire of our middle school teachers, we already own two big bot 3D printers, so that cost is cut in half. Vinyl cutter, we have one of those as well. On the high school side, due to the generosity of the rich PTO, we have a laser cutter, uh, so that's a big price tag item. 
So we already have some of these items in place, and it's, it's an acquisition that can take place over a couple years. We don't have to necessarily buy everything all at one shot. We can do that through our regular collection process. So to bring it all home for the last two slides, I think, uh, this is a timeline of how this would roll out. So I won't go into you know, reading through it. You can look through and read. Uh, the first year one was this year, the current year. It's going to end with creating the AP uh, through science curriculum this summer. So it'll run next year. Um, we had good enrollment for that. And year two is going to be year two, which is, is 15, 16, is going to begin the um, design, budgeting, and rollout of all these initiatives. And so that would mean that the year 16, 17 uh, through 2019, 2020 would be the full by road that was startling for a second. 2020? Um, yes, 2020 would be the, the final year, that senior year rollout of uh, the road uh, at that bridge. So that would be the full year. So you can follow through that to some of the implementation uh, and the processes that have to go on uh, to bring us to fruition. I think it's manageable the fact that uh, when you have a cohort model moving through, you're only really designing one year at a time. Right? So you're building that ninth grade year students, and then as that year's taking place, you're building the 10th grade year to follow. So you can make little adjustments as you go uh, based on the cohort. So uh, we think there are many benefits to it. We tried to put together a program for the district, the whole committee did, that really uh, entailed strong <coughs> academic options, which include Project Lead the Way, right, it's college connections, the new AP research and seminar, um, as well as other AP courses a special course we've created, as well as options for all students. So to put it to the cohort, but also any student can take the course. And layer that in with the concept of a makerspace and a location for, for all students to be able to work uh, within the building. So trying to put those things together, uh, it took a while. It took us a good 10 months to continue to work, work away from this point. But we think we're very happy with the product. Uh, that's, we think uh, spells out the details of the vision that each school started with when they began the process. And uh, I hope that came across my presentation tonight. So here are some of the benefits we think uh, are, are key to this model. Those. But thank you for listening. I hope you found it uh, interesting and entertaining. And
small process, as we've seen with writing the agreement. So that is the point of choosing a project lead place to get overlap earlier mentioned. And then my other question regarding the selection process. I, I am the Engineering as it ties to the environment, so clean air, 
water, uh, pollution, sanitation, all those issues that are dealt with by engineers, but are very specific to uh, these environmental issues. So that's, we thought that would make a good third trend. Could there be a fourth? It's not impossible, but the more you add, the more you dilute that initial cohort, the smaller sections you get, the more staff you need. So we thought three struck a good balance of topics and staffing that we wouldn't overcommit ourselves to needing you know, five staff members. If you're building all these maker spaces, I would have thought you would have had to surprise that is because it's similar to the Did you know we can hear you back there? Can you hear me? Yeah, these are the people in Thank you. I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, I just thought if you're going to have all these maker spaces, it lends itself to mechanical engineering more so than the other engineering you have right now. Okay. Just think. And then um, the AP research. Okay. Where would that AP research go in this? It would be your second elective of your senior year. It would be paired with, because all these AP seminar, AP, AP research is supposed to be paired with another course that's going to drive the research that you do. So we have it automatically paired for them here, right? Seminar. You would take AP research as your second elective as a senior. Now, you might have more, obviously. You're not taking some other book for your social studies. You might have another elective slot. But generally, your second elective slot would be, so for instance, I would be in computational problem solving, and I would take AP research as another senior elective. And we would hope, they don't have to, but we would want that student to pair it with what they're working on in that course for their research project. So is that, can you hear me? Is that something like the uh, Intel it, it would be separate. It would be separate. It could be something you co-work on. So in other words, you can work on something that's also admissible for that competition, but it's not specific. AP research is its own course. It's a college board course. It's a college, it's a brand new college board course. Yeah, it's actually it's the first year it's going to be offered is next year. Um, like I said, it's meant to be, you know, competition from IB, you know, obviously they were they were under pressure to create something a little more rigorous, so they could research seminars or two courses. And students who take just those two um, get a certificate, you get an AP research certificate you graduate with. Students who take those two and get four, three or better, so you know, three passing scores on other APs can graduate with um, AP. Yeah. Uh, okay, so $5,000 pays for is the continuing ed training. 
So the workshops, the um, you know webinars you can do through the year. The summer training, the week summer training, um, is is three thousand uh, dollars for each staff member you send. Take the test and get credit at um, certain universities. So, 
can choose to do that or not. Some schools choose not to. So a student can do that. Or a student can, you know, senior year say, I want to take, you know, one elective. I just want to take one of these. That's fine too. Uh, this one I'm going to put in the water. So if they can do all that, but well, we wanted to have an option um, for students, for that group of students who know, this is where I let, you know, I was, you know, doing this since I was little. I was the one putting the Legos together and, you know, never stopped. Um, it kind of grew and grew and grew, and now what, what do we have for that student? And right now, we have a very strong, comprehensive high school, right? I mean, that's what Ridge is, and it's very good at what it does. Um, but what it misses is the that other piece that kind of, I don't want to say non-academic, it's certainly academic, but the academic piece that's not driven by content is instead driven by process and product. So that's that's kind of the angle. Right. Oh. Yes. Um, as it relates to prerequisites. So, in the flow chart, it's obvious, right? They take the freshman year course and that proceeds the sophomore year course. Where do these fit in and are there requirements for those, like Elaine was referring to, who maybe just want to dabble and get a flavor for something about the only grade that they Right, so for, for the project lead the way courses, if I'm not mistaken, there's the initial course. So that, that freshman year course, it's uh, which the is, CSC. there you go, right, yeah, the CSC and IED, there you see it, they're almost like really project lead the way personal, right, just using the letters. Um, that's the initial course, that's the gateway to the 11th. Right? So everything after that course can be taken. So a student who wanted to say take, um, and I'm not, I have to double check this, but I believe it's correct. Say I wanted to take cybersecurity um, as an elective, you, you would have to take your science and software engineering as a prerequisite. I have to work back through to be sure, but I know, it, I know it's not more than one. Because the project we made is designed for a gateway course, a bunch of elective courses, some are, some are larger follow-ups, some are just optionals, and then sometimes they offer a capstone, and that capstone in this case is computational problem solving, which is a defined end of the road for the computer science project. What would the public comment when we get the public to public comment on agenda items. So if you had a comment on the presentation or anything else in the agenda, now would be the time.